Thank you guys. Um, Shane and I are just delighted to be here tonight uh, to present for Brains for Business. So first of all, every single day, you are asked to make a split-second decision about someone else. So when you came here this evening to come to this talk and you found your seat, did you know the person sitting next to you? Maybe yes or maybe no. If you didn't know them, you had to make a decision about them. You had to decide whether they were a friend or a foe. And you do it like that. Think of yourself walking down a dark alley at night and you see a person coming towards you. You have to decide whether that person is a friend or a foe, if that person could potentially hurt you or if that's someone who's safe. Think about getting on an airplane. I'm sure you check out who's sitting next to you, don't you? And you decide if you want to talk to that person and if you don't want to talk to them, you avoid any eye contact whatsoever. So how do we do this? How does this brain of ours make these decisions so quickly? Well, there are tons and tons of different characteristics that you might want to consider when making a judgment about someone. You might want to consider their intelligence. You might want to consider their kindness. You might want to consider their previous behaviors. You might want to ask their friends. You might want to ask colleagues. But you don't have time. You're in that back alley, in that dark alley, and you just don't have time to consider all the factors that you could. So our brain has evolved. Our brain is very smart, and it has come up with two characteristics. Warmth. When you meet somebody new, the first characteristic that you judge is warmth. And that's, does this person make you feel warm? Now, what makes me feel warm might be something different than what Shane might feel. So warmth would be generosity. It would be if you feel that that person is kind. And that's the first thing that your brain does. The second thing is it judges competency. Does this person have the ability to carry out what they say that they're going to do? So think about the person in the back alley. It might be hard for you to judge whether they're, they're warm or whether they're not warm, but you can judge if they're competent. If they seem like a big person, if they seem like they have a gun or something in the shape of a gun, they're very competent at hurting you. So again, thinking about warmth and competence. So Susan Fisk is a professor at Princeton, and she has come up with a model to help study this matrix of warmth and competence. So you can see here, on one side, we have high warmth and low warmth, and then high competence and low competence. And we can think about groups that might fall into the different categories. When we think about the handicapped, or when we think about maybe older people, you sort of feel a sense of warmth towards them. You think about an old granny you feel a sense of warmth towards her. But you might not judge her as being competent. Would you still trust her to drive if her eyesight is going? So people who fall in these groups of being high in warmth but low in competence actually elicit from us a feeling of pity. Ah, oh bless. And then we have the next group. These are the people who are high in warmth and high in competence. So think about an Irish Olympic athlete. If we had someone in the Olympics here in Ireland, we would be so proud. We'd admire that person. We'd see that person as being warm, but also very, very good at what they do. So this category, being low in warmth and low in competence, these would be people, perhaps such as drug addicts. If you see a line of people lined up outside a methadone clinic, could be seen as the homeless. Groups that are seen as low in competence and also low in warmth. And Shane's going to explain in a few minutes here, we actually dehumanize these groups. And finally, <laughs> there are people out there who would be low in warmth, but very competent in doing what they intend to do. So we thought that we'd play a little game with you guys to begin. This guy, Homer Simpson. Does everyone know who Homer Simpson is? OK, put your hand up if you feel that he is warm. Now keep your hand up if you feel that he's also competent. So I think it was a unanimous vote there. But we're going to use a few other images as well. What about his wife, Marge? You think that she's warm? Keep your hand up if you also think that she's competent. So you can see, we're going to go through a few more examples, but this is, and you guys are deciding the same thing on all these people. We're seeing the same warmth and the same competence. King Nidge, 
This is from the show Love Hate for those people who aren't Irish. How many people here think that he's competent? How many people think he's warm? So again, <laughs> unanimous decision. This is from The Good Wife. Her character is... Alicia Florig. Alicia Florig. And I do really like this show. And I would say, put your hands up if you think she's competent. And keep your hands up if you think that she's warm. I think she's very warm. But again, we can have differing opinions on how we see these individuals. Mary McAleese. How many people think that she's both warm and competent? Joey from Friends. <laughs> How many people think he's warm, competent? <laughs> and remember when I was saying, and it's up there, that we sometimes feel pity towards these sorts of people who are warm, but maybe not competent. I could put it in another way. There are people out there, perhaps like Joey, who you might meet, and you get along really well with them and think, yeah, I want to invite this guy for a coffee, or I'd love to go out with this guy on the weekend, but would you hire Joey for a job or recommend him? No. But then there are people that you might meet who are highly competent. You know that they get the work done, and you might recommend them to be hired for a job, but you don't want to be inviting them over to your house, or you don't want to be cuddling with them on the couch. <laughs> Darth Vader? <laughs> high in competence? Keep your hands up if you also think he's high in warmth. Nope. <laughs> Katie Hopkins, and I know Shane has a very, very strong opinion about this woman. How many people think that she is low in warmth? Low in, com or low in competence too, right Shane? <laughs> and finally, the godfather. Um, hands up if high in warmth. High in confidence. So we have some differing, differing opinions here. Don't mix them up with his son. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a really nice matrix to think about how we make judgments about people and how we make judgments about brands. We'll get to the brands a little bit later, but there's a whole neuroscience behind this. Why we know this is true, and why do we know it's true? So what we know, and I'm going to jump to my bottom line straight up here, is that we have an axis in the brain uh, running from here, medial prefrontal cortex, running all the way to the back, uh, something called posterior retrosplenial which is activated when we make judgments about people. Now, I want to draw your attention especially to this little blob just there. This is the medial prefrontal gyrus, and this is activated when we make judgments about the uh, intentionality that another person can engage in. Do they have an interior mental life? And this is the part of the brain that's also activated when we think about our own mental life, our own ability to talk to ourselves about what it is that we do. So that's the bottom line I'm going to jump to, and then I'm going to make a deviation from it in a moment. Uh, so how would we study this? Well, what we do, or what one would do, is bring you uh, to the laboratory, pop you in a brain scanner, and we would challenge you with images. So this poor unfortunate, you have to make a judgment as to uh, what category you think this person might sit into. Uh, you have your three, or your four categories here. And we take an image through the brain when you're making this judgment. Then we give you a, a rest period, 12 seconds, uh, you look at the Swiss cross, and then we do the same procedure again, and we give you this wonderful individual uh, counting his money, uh, and we get you to make the same judgment. And we do that repeatedly. And then we ask, what brain areas are associated with what type of judgment uh, that you've made? And this is what we see. Uh, uh, if we take the area of, of uh, high warmth, high competence first, you get this big activation here, this posterior activation, uh, but also, again, this area in prefrontal. Uh, high competence, low warmth, we get exactly the same activation sitting up here again in, in medial prefrontal. And similarly, for the Homer Simpson category, elicits a, a slight feeling of pity, uh, and we don't think he's a very good nuclear power plant uh, technician, but we do like him. Now, for the Outgroup for the category that we regard as low in warmth and low in competence, what do we see? Well, we see something quite different. For an outgroup that is regarded or that elicits feelings of disgust, we actually get an activation in the part of the brain that's involved in the feeling of illness and the, the feeling of making, uh, feeling a little bit sick. Uh, th these, this is the insula. Uh, it's about two centimeters in on either side. And medial prefrontal cortex, this gyrus just here, is completely absent. You don't see anything um, for people who are ranked as being part of this category. Now, it doesn't matter what the outgroup is. It just matters that you are part of that outgroup. 
So the model, I think, uh, that Fisk proposes has a lot of legs in terms of how uh, the brain itself works. Um, you start uh, with a categorization of individuals as being part of an outgroup. Um, they induce somehow disgust. Now, they don't have to be drug addicts. They could be any uh, outgroup at all. Um, you get a loss of activation in medial prefrontal cortex, uh, indicating that this outgroup is seen to have less of an interior mental life. They're regarded as slightly less than human, and you get this uh, stereotype then of, of the, the person being dehumanized. So. <laughs> so when we think about typical, typical groups, outgroups that could be perceived as competent, like the Donald Trump example, competent but not warm, but being cold, you could think about money lenders maybe who are charging exorbitant rates for you to borrow money from them. They have something that you want or that you need, which is the money, but you don't have that feeling that that person is caring for you. We could think about bankers. Sorry if we have any bankers. Uh, we could think about bankers, again, as having something that you want, or insurance agents having something that you want, but they're not exactly touchy-feely in how they're going about conducting business. I'm sure there are people here who have had the excitement of buying a new car or a new house. And it's very, very exciting. It's a very warm feeling, especially perhaps if you're doing that with a partner. Lots and lots of things going on. And then you have to go and you have to meet with the insurance agents. And the insurance agents are not sharing your joy in this experience. They're trying to get the money from you for the policy, the policy that you need. But it wouldn't necessarily be a warm experience. And we can think of maybe the haughty aristocrats who maybe have a lot of money and so therefore can have a lot of influence, but again, don't elicit that sort of warm feeling from us. But what about outgroups that are cold and incompetent? So Shane and I were brainstorming about this a couple of weeks ago and that the categories that we kind of came up with, cable companies, who here has had to deal with UPS or UPC, sorry? UPC. I know I've had to deal with them, and it was not pleasant at all. Automated customer service lines. You call up, and you're asked to listen through a message and press you know, a number between one and five, and then you get to that menu, and you're on to the next menu, and you know it could be 23 minutes later, and then you're cut off, and you have to start over again. So that leaves you sort of feeling disgusted that this group is so cold and also incompetent. HSC. Now, we might have really, really warm and competent nurses and doctors and technicians in Ireland, but oftentimes what I hear, and I'm only back in Ireland a couple of years, I hear that the system is really, really hard to access. So it might leave you feeling very, very frustrated. So there's a central idea that we really want to get across here. You, you, you know, it's tautological. You have a single brain, obviously, unless uh, you're, you're very lucky. <laughs> 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 um, but that brain has to be put to multiple uses. Uh, and the implication of that is that we don't have so many brain regions. Uh, you know, you've got 48 cortical areas, for example, in total. So they have to serve multiple functions. And uh, it turns out to be the case that the brain regions that are involved in, for example, the assessment of physical warmth, how warm you are feeling now uh, in this environment. Is the environment itself warm? Are you feeling warm? Uh, are also the same brain regions that are involved in the assessment of social warmth, but without the sensory input that has to do with uh, social warmth. And also, and this is something we're going to talk about at the end, uh, they're the same brain regions that are involved in feelings of warmth towards brands. Uh, brands are people too. That the brain areas that are used for people perception are also the same brain areas that are used uh, for brand perception. So we're going to play the game again. <laughs> So here we have Susan Fisk's matrix. And just as Shane said, we're talking about judging people as being warm and competent. But now let's switch over to brands, because we make judgments about brands as well. How many people here think that Cadbury's is a warm brand? And do you think it's competent? It's a pretty consistent product and tasty product. This is an interesting one, Marlboro cigarettes. So some people who are smokers in the audience actually might rate them as being fairly competent, if that's the, the rush or the buzz that the cigarette gives you. They might rate them as being more um, competent. But others of you might rate them as very low in competence because they kill people. 
um, and low in warmth because <laughs> killing people is not a warm thing to do. <laughs> Coca-Cola is also an example of a brand that has a lot of warmth to it. And what we find is that brands that are seen as warm and competent, if they make a mistake, they often can bounce back if they do it right. Rolls-Royce, of course, a luxury car brand. How many people think that these cars are competent, that they run well? How many of you have a warm and fuzzy feeling about them? So not as warm. So we might feel envious of someone who has a Rolls-Royce. Anglo-Irish Bank. Um, from what one of my cousins tells me, Anglo-Irish Bank perhaps in the past would have been seen as being warm and also competent, but I'd say these days, neither. Would you agree with me? Johnson & Johnson is a really good example of a brand who is seen as warm and competent, but also has had various different things happen through the years, such as Tylenol in the US um, being tainted and having to recall a bunch of Tylenol, but they were able to bounce back based on their warmth and competence. And then my personal favorite, Apple. I have a Mac, and I'm very attached to it. And for some reason, I feel like I love my Mac. And I know, Shane, you've got a new Surface, and you said to me earlier, you actually feel like you love the new Surface. So <laughs> there's something about Apple that they have that's going on right. I know that Apple, my little Mac, is going to work. But the thing I also love about them is that when I call the Apple helpline, I don't get an automated service. I get a person who speaks uh, English that I can understand. So they have that warmth to them as well. Or even when you go to the Apple stores and you sign up for an appointment with their Genius Bar. So Shane has a very good example of a very current company that's going through some crisis. <laughs> so I'm sure you all recognize this. So how many of you recognize this as Volkswagen? Obviously everybody. Now can I ask how many people own a Volkswagen here? Now, uh, how many of you, whether you own a Volkswagen or not, feel let down by Volkswagen? So, that's interesting, isn't it? More people uh, are feel let down by Volkswagen than are actually Volkswagen owners. So, will it impact on your decision to own a Volkswagen in the future? Hand up if you think yes. Uh, so, they've got a disaster, um, and initially the, the response to blame the underlings hasn't been a, a, an especially uh, good uh, response on their part. Mm -hmm. So it really comes to bear, and I think this is a great example, of we work so hard to build up our, our reputations. And think about the companies that you guys work for and the reputation that your company has. It takes a long time to build your reputation, and it can just be shattered like that, like Volkswagen has potentially done. So I made the claim earlier on, brands are people too. So here's an example of how you might do a study like that. So instead of bringing people to the lab and getting them to judge faces and in-groups and out-groups, what we do is we get them to judge brands that they might like or dislike. So for example here, Lacoste. And uh, we get people to give ratings as to the warmth and competence that they feel uh, towards those brands. And what do we find? Well, what we find is medial prefrontal cortex is activated when you're thinking about how much you like your brand. Uh, the same part of the brain that's used to think about how others have mental lives is also the same part of the brain that you use to think about the mental life of something that doesn't have a life. Uh, because you attribute agency uh, in some way to this uh, brand that you have uh, an association with. Even more remarkably, uh, when uh, you're asking people to make judgments about brands that they love, you get the buzz, the feeling of warmth. What happens? Well, just here, this is the uh, head of the caudate nucleus. It's part of the brain's reward system. And that comes on when uh, you're looking at a brand that you happen to love. And it doesn't come on when you look at a brand that you don't happen to love. So that, that feeling of buzz that you get, that's where it's coming from. Now, is the claim that brands are people uh, entirely crazy? I don't think so, uh, actually. Uh, we're here sitting in Trinity College. Trinity College was founded in 1492 as a, quote, body corporate. Uh, in other words, as an institution that has a life and an agency independent of the individuals that are, are part of the institution. It will live on, although those of us who make up the institution will disappear in due course. And the law in the US and in Europe and many other places is, it recognizes companies uh, as having uh, corp uh, uh, the same kind of corporate status as, as individuals. They are agents in their, in their, own, life, in their own right. 
So in sort of wrapping up tonight's presentation, a few things to th think of. So we have the one brain, we're using the same brain areas to do different jobs. And we're basing our judgments on people based on their warmth and competence. And we're doing the exact same thing for brands. So the same areas of the brain are functioning in making that judgment about people and also about brands. So really, what does this mean for your organization? When you go back to work tomorrow, what will you be able to take from this talk back to your companies? And if you were able to sort of capitalize on this concept of warmth and competence, would that mean increased loyalty to a brand? Would that mean increased sales? And you might think, OK, I'm going to go back into the office tomorrow, and I'm going to make sure that my company, the front-facing people in my company, are going to be perceived as warm and competent. In, a, in my case, Alltech is going to be perceived as warm and competent. But this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Sometimes you don't want to be seen as warm and competent. Sometimes you do. So a couple of two little examples here. Um, UPC, which I just complained about a few minutes ago. Oh my gosh, I used to hate having to call their automated line to try to pay for my internet service. Then I saw last week that Virgin was, being take, was taking over UPC. And I did a little dance of joy in my head because I thought this is going to be so much easier. I've never flown on a Virgin airline. I've never really had interactions with Virgin. But I know that they pride themselves on their customer service. So on Sunday. I got a text message to my phone saying that my Virgin, used to be UPC, bill was due. And I thought, well, let's see how this goes. I was planning on spending maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes on the phone with their automated service um, system that they have. Well, the whole payment of my bill for Virgin took about 45 seconds over the phone. It was brilliant. And so Virgin has really come in to a company that I wasn't seeing, seeing as being warm and competent at all, completely changed my mindset. But let's think about a charity and how they want to be perceived. So I'll use, for an example, the Jack and Jill Foundation here. Now, if I'm giving my money to a charitable organization, I want to know that that charity is organized, that they're going to make good decisions about how to use the money that I'm giving. I want them to be very, very competent. And I also want them to have a warmth to them. So I want the company, the charity, to be warm and competent. Now, who is Jack and Jill helping? Well, they're helping children who are not where they should be developmentally, maybe handicapped children. Those very children that they're helping are a group that I would perceive in a warm way, but not in a competent way, because those children are children who need extra help. So this is an example of we want the charity to be seen as warm and competent, but actually the group that they're helping Jack and Jill Foundation want us to see that group as warm but not competent. So we feel pity, and we want to give to the foundation who's trying to help them. So you can see there are various nuances to this. So, um, so that's what we have for you in terms of the neuroscience behind how we make these decisions on people and brands. And I think it's just really something that's so straightforward. And when Shane started to tell me about an idea for this talk, um, you know, in all my studying as a psychologist, I had never really thought about this matrix design of warmth and competence. And once I was exposed to it, I feel like I'm using it in, in my everyday life. Warm and competent? Warm and competent? <laughs> Shane, you're warm and competent. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so we're going to open it up to just now? Yeah, definitely. And we have um, a lot of questions and uh, comments coming in already. So just remember, you can tweet us with um, hashtag brain for business or go to sli.do um, and then put in the numbers. I think it's 8182 um, or 8281, actually, and we'll get your questions and comments here. Um, so before we go to those, we might just talk through some of the elements that were in your presentation. Now, I don't want to show off and use the proper names for the different parts of the brain, so we'll just call them blobs. But um, <laughs> you say that different blobs light up based on the warmth and the, the competence. I mean, how, how many times can we meet somebody before that changes? So say, for example, if I meet you the first time and you're lovely and you're warm, and then I meet you the next time and you're not so lovely and warm. I mean, how, how many times does it take for the brain, the perception of, of, of somebody to change? Do, are we very instantaneous? Are we forgiving? Or does it depend on I person to person? Well, there's an old joke about how you, you can't make a, a second impression a first time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't know is the answer to that, is, is, is the honest answer. Mm. Um, 
I think it is the case that in person perception you have this primacy effect and that it takes a long time uh, for you to change your opinion of people. Okay. So if you encounter the individual and you like them and you feel good with them, even if they start to behave in slightly uh, unpleasant ways, yes. uh, it takes you a long time to actually act on that and change your opinion of that person. You know what I would add to that in terms of reinforcement theory that we know? Um, so I worked a lot with children in Chicago and if a parent is trying to reinforce a child um, for a good behavior or a bad behavior or say a child is trying to get candy from the mom mm -hmm. as they're they're checking out in the grocery line. And that child will try and try and try and maybe not be successful until the 10th time. Then they're going to try the behavior again and again after that because they know eventually it's going to have work. success. So I guess I'm, I'm using that as sort of a, an inverse of you could have all these good impressions mm. that you've made on, the, on this person and then you do one thing that's really bad and it changes it. And the fact that the same part of the brain is used for people and brands, would the same be true then of a, of a brand? So for, say for example, I had a Dell laptop when I was in college and I loved it, but then three weeks before I was due to finish, it died and all my work disappeared and I would never buy a Dell laptop again. It, that, that's something that's obviously in my brain. So is it the same kind of perception that, you know, again, you'd be kind of willing to let brands, do we give them a second go or is it a very snap decision or is it... It's a human emotional response as well as a... I think that it would really depend on how the brand is positioned. Now, when I think about Dell, and I've never had a Dell, but I don't get a warm, fuzzy feeling. I get a feeling Nor do that I anymore. <laughs> I can tell you now. I would sort of have the perception that that's a functional computer. Mm. Um, I think if my Apple broke, I'd be devastated, but I'd probably buy another one. Okay. So it might be based on the warmth of the brand to begin with. Okay. And Shane, you said something about sort of a feeling of illness when we don't think someone, somebody is warm or competent. Is the, what physical effects of that oh, does, does the brain, I suppose, does the brain's perception have on, uh, on the body? You know, because I know, for example, if I meet someone and I'm kind of, I'm unsure of them, you get butterflies in your tummy or whatever. Well, what other impacts does, does it have? Uh, so, the, 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 unfortunately, this is a big and complicated story. So, I, I, awesome. I give a, oh, maybe not. <laughs> give, a, I give you a simple example. So, um, if I brought you to the lab uh, and I asked you to bring your partner along with you or somebody, your mother or whatever, and I pop you in a, in a brain scanner and we do a, a, a task where you get electric shocked or your mother gets electric shocked and you see her getting electric shocked, what we'll see in you when you get electric shocked is activation in your arm so that uh, you'll feel the pain in your arm and you get activation in the brain in the, a part of the brain called the, uh, the pain matrix. And we'll also see you making a motor movement because you make the jerk when you get, electric, uh, you get the electric shock. When you see the other person being electric shocked, all you get is the central response. Uh, and this is why we have a, a rapid and instantaneous response to other people in distress. So there's no uh, motor component, there's no sensory component, there's just this uh, uh, central component. And I think exactly the same thing happens here. That uh, we have this uh, central disgust response, but it's not coupled with the feeling of in the throat or any of those other things. Mm. So that, that's why, in one sense, it's an extremely powerful response, but in another sense, uh, it can be a very plastic response because it's not actually coupled to all the other things that happens when you feel ill. Okay, it's very interesting. And you, you, you also spoke about brands like Coca-Cola, for example, and the power of advertising is incredible because you see things like, we all know the Santa ad at, at Christmas from Coca-Cola, and that's when you know Christmas is coming. But how does that impact, say, if, for example, if the day that we saw that ad, there was also like a human rights issue in the news or something like that, the, the conflict between, between I suppose, the, the fuzzy side of the brand, which are, are people more in tune or more likely to, to be geared towards are we easily manipulated, I suppose, is the question. Well, I love the Budweiser ad, but I never drink Budweiser. Okay, <laughs> okay, so we don't get swayed that easily. Yeah, maybe not. Advertising. Yeah. I have a, a brother-in-law whom I won't name, who's a part-time politician, and I, I was talking to him about these topics, and uh, he uh, used to be a council member uh, for a, a, a county council, and he said, actually, what they always do is attack the other person's competence, but they never, ever think of attacking the other person's warmth. Um, and I think if, if uh, politicians didn't want to go negative, but they, they wanted to do an injury to the other person, a smart way to do it is to represent the other individual as cold. Um, because when you say that somebody's cold and incompetent, you're actually attacking the, the twin pillars that uh, the rest of us will perceive them by. It's actually interesting that you mentioned that because I work for a radio station and I know that when we have guests in, there's a particular politician who comes in and when he's talking about a key issue, he will always refer it back to himself and his family rather than talking just, you know, straight to policy or anything like that. It's about how it impacts him. Uh, him. And it does, it makes him seem like a warmer person. So I suppose we are kind of 
it's, it's a very clever tool, I suppose, yeah. of, of appearing, putting yourself out there as being a, a warmer human. Do, do things like, you know, we're talking about American politics there briefly, but, you know, the Saturday Night Live and the comedy sketches that Hillary Clinton is now doing, I mean, that is part of her defrosting of, of the image, I suppose. Absolutely. It, it's, it's, it's entertaining to watch, though, that you kind of see her thaw out being really mean about it, but you kind of do see her laughing and telling jokes. She's, she's showing her human side, and she's showing that she can be relatable and that she can have a laugh too, and uh, not as quite as scary. Mm. Now, people here on Twitter using hashtag Brain for Business, they're picking up on the uh, the, the slide you showed about how you can, you know, it can take 20 years to build up a brand and it can be destroyed within minutes. If you were a brand like Volkswagen now, who are in the middle of this. A uh, bit of a storm. How do you build up? Do they have to wait the 20 years, or is there? How can they change their image and sort of rehabil rehabilitate their image? Well, I think that the first thing that they need to do, which they've done now, is to acknowledge the wrongdoing. You know, when we make a mistake, it's best to acknowledge it right away. And um, there was an example um, in a book that both Shane and I read just recently, and they were talking about Domino's Pizza over in the U.S. and they were having all sorts of problems that the pizza, the quality of the pizza was not as good as it should be or was advertised. And either way, the CEO of the company went on the Super Bowl and had, went on a Super Bowl ad and gave an apology to the American public and was, said that they were going to change their ways. And this really helped them to turn around their business. So, you know, in terms of Volkswagen, I think the first piece is the acknowledgement and then doing something about it quickly and showing that they're competent. Okay, and would the same thing ha work for, again, to go back to the Clintons briefly, but we all know about the Bill Clinton, Lewinsky thing. With the politician, do you need to stand up and say, look, I messed up here, and then you can move on? Do you have to acknowledge in order to, to progress, I suppose? Or can you ever just put a plaster over something and just hope it goes away? Well, Bill's ratings never went down during that Lewinsky That's true. Year, uh, probably because he came across as a human being. Mm. <laughs> and warm. And warm, yeah. yeah. And so if we look the... <laughs> Make of that what you will. <laughs> Is that from experience? <laughs> anyway, we'll move quickly along. <laughs> Protect Shane's reputation. Anyway, um, but if we look at a politician, say for example, like Jeremy Corbyn, who I feel kind of sorry for him, and I don't know why, but like, you know, am I an idiot for feeling sorry for him? Like, what, how do you... Just because he falls into the high warmth, low confidence. It's a bit of a Homer Simpson. Makes, makes you feel, oh, yeah. blessed. Corbyn is remarkable because 60, I think it's 62% of his own voters mm. uh, don't think he's competent in the latest YouGov poll, but they voted for him anyway. <laughs> um, but they also don't think he's going to be uh, prime minister. So he's reflecting something else. Um, but he, he's certainly not reflecting what's needed to be an effective politician, which is that you get into power and you make change in policy. Interesting. Uh, some of the questions, Alan here has just sent in a question saying, does technology change this? So I suppose the, the, the judgment of judging if someone is warm, because I'm one of those people who never say hello or kind regards or thanks very much in an email. I'm very much, I want something from you. Jessica, it did, so but I'm quite a warm person. So I mean, you know, so it's you like, yeah, I'm lovely. You should all be friends with me. Uh, but it, so I, I presume technology is changing how we judge people. Is it? Well, I think that say you take a company like Amazon, mm. and they have done a lot of work to try to make their user interface warm and to make it now. Really scathing article came out of, about them in the New York Times, but. Before all that, now I have a different opinion of them. Every time I've ordered something from Amazon, you know, you get to see the other customers' ratings, and it comes to you really quickly, so they're super competent, everything's always in stock. But they seem to have made an effort to make their user interface in technology have that human warmth to it. And sticking with sort of the technology side of things, uh, Jumanji on Twitter said, um, be interested to see the effect of Tinder on the brain. How long does it take users to swipe left or right? <laughs> Well, contrary to what you said a couple of minutes ago, <laughs> I have never used Tinder. So. Really? <laughs> yes. But I suppose it, the concept is that somebody that you're going Maybe to potentially... Does, but. Yeah, we'll get the on the line there. Uh, <laughs> no, but a, like, uh, the idea is that these images just pop up and you are making split-second decisions. So what factors, like, what are you, I suppose it's different for different people, but when an image pops up, is it if they're smiling, is there like, what's the optimum Tinder image? <laughs> Not asking for myself, it's for a friend. It, it should be one with a smile. Okay. Uh, uh, because smiling floods the brain with positive affect. Uh, okay. We know that. Uh, you, if you take the same face and you present it with a scowl or a smile, mm. obviously, behaviourally, people are going to prefer the one with the smile. But you get a nice kick in the brain's reward centre when you're looking at somebody who's got a, a sincere smile, but it must be a real smile, not a fake smile. And something that, that Shane and I were discussing before the talk was biases that people might have, unconscious bias. and 
they might play into that too, don't you think? Yeah. 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 Who you pick? Yeah. Sorry, I was just remembering our conversation. Oh. <laughs> what about duck face? You know, people who do the pout. How does the brain perceive that? Because there's a lot of pictures on Tinder apparently of duck face. It doesn't look good. Yeah, but if you can do an ironic duck face, then that's fine. Oh, really? Yeah. Does irony work well in the brain? Do people like, yeah? Of course it does. Yeah? But how can you pull off an ironic duck face? We can try that later. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, a lot of questions coming in now using hashtag Brain for Business on Twitter. Um, Tyg asks, is there a strong correlation between extroverts and warmth? No, there's not, actually. Uh, believe it or not. Really? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, Jumanji is back on again asking, which is most important, warmth or competence when it comes to brands? Gosh. Yeah. No, I think it depends on the brand. I was going to say. Um, you know, you don't want an auditor of a company to be warm. You want them to be cold and austere and unforgiving, uh, but extremely competent at what they do. Uh, what, you know, and if the financial regulator had been a little bit more like that, uh, this country might have suffered less over the last few years. But instead, he was useless. <laughs> but I would imagine that there are other jobs that warmth would be more. If if the job demands aren't huge, um, that maybe warmth, or if it was customer service facing, that maybe warmth is where. Um, where you'd need to be. Mm -hmm. There's another question here now um, from Misha saying, when you ask someone for their perceptions of a brand, does it ever contradict what the brain mapping is telling you? Oh, so that they're lying to us? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know of any experiments that's been, oh. that's been done on that, but it, it would be relatively easy to dissociate surface compliance or uh, surface rankings from uh, what's actually happening in terms of the brain. And you say that warmth is important. C can you Fake warmth, like can the brain detect fake warmth? So if you come up and give me like a really awkward hug and call me hun, like yeah. what part of the brain detects You've already the detected that? Haven't <laughs> yeah, completely. Yeah. I'm not a fan of yeah, the hun. Don't hug me. Please. Yeah, no, don't touch me. I but uh, like, what part does the brain trigger that? Is that the same part of warmth? Like, is it the same blob in the brain? Very hard to do those experiments in a brain imaging scanner. Really, hug hugs. people. Yeah, yeah. doesn't no, work what, really. What people are very good at doing and do very very rapidly is tell the difference between a fake smile and uh, a real smile mm. uh, and a proper. Uh, smile involves crinkling at the edge of the eyes as well as uh, the crinkles around the okay. mouth. Uh, and that's actually hard to do, that Duchenne smile is, is a difficult thing to do. It is, and there, there's some interesting studies, another book I'll share with you, Shane, looking at whether you have that real smile or the fake smile, and looking at, they, they did a study of waitresses, and whether they had the real smile or the fake smile, and people can tell, and this was in the states where this study was done, um, waitresses who showed the real smile got higher amounts of tips. <laughs> than people who were showing, showing the fake smile. So we can tell. There's another anonymous question. I don't know why it's anonymous. That makes me suspicious. But it's saying, it's interesting throughout history how propaganda is used to move people or groups into different quadrants, such as during wars, etc. cetera. Um, and then another anonymous one is, how is this new research um, being manipulated? And basically asking how long have they been manipulated? Like how long, I suppose, how, how do we know when we are being manipulated, how do we know that there's not, you know, brands, you said you love your Apple computer. If you found out tomorrow that, you know, behind the scenes there's awful, awful things happening, I suppose we would feel quite manipulated. How long have we been looking at this area of the brain when it comes to brands? Like, when did we discover that there was the kind of the same? I, this is only in the last few years, but what we do now know is that when people feel betrayed by a brand, it takes about three days to get over. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the, the, the depth of, of warmth that we have and the, the associations with our lovely Surface Pro there, uh, oh. You'll get over it. <laughs> really? Yeah, you will. Oh, what do you know? I would have to say, back to the Amazon um, example of having this nice interface when you're ordering products from them, and I've always perceived them as being warm, but there really was a horrible article, very good article, but damning article written on them in the New York Times a few weeks ago, and basically it was saying that they really don't treat their employees that well. And I now know that that's influenced my use of ordering from Amazon, because I'm thinking that they're not as touchy-feely and competent as I thought that they were. Interesting. So they've kind of manipulated their, their user interface, so I thought something of them, yeah. which was then... Well, I suppose that feeds back into the question that I asked at the beginning then. I suppose how many chances do we give? I suppose when something is very much exposed in the media or when we watch you know, the BBC Panorama programmes, I suppose it does, that does have a big impact. There's an interesting question here from Richard saying, how much of an effect would a person's state of mind or humour affect their perception of a brand? So, you know, like if you're in, go from I, the last brain for business, Shane, we spoke about, um, you know, if a judge is hungry, they're more likely to send you down. Whereas if you give a judge a Snickers before you're being done for speeding, you might get off. You might get off. So, so does that impact then, I suppose, brand perception as well? I, I, 
again, I don't have any data in the area, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised that it has an effect. Um, you know, brands that make you consistently smile and feel good are ones that, that you are going to like. Now, whether you will act on them or not is, a, is another issue entirely. Mm. And just from your experience, how have you, you know, implemented or how, how, how do you put these kind of findings into practice? Or is there examples that you can give us of, I suppose, some of the work that you have done that illustrates this a little bit more? Sure. So in, in Altec, um, I run the, the educational initiatives. And actually, I said to my group, we had um, a little retreat a few months ago. And I said that they had all been picked for warmth and now that they had to show me their competence. <laughs> and something that I, I see, you know, when, when we're doing hiring in Alltech or when I'm working with people in my team, it's very hard to teach warmth. Warmth is a soft skill. It's something that you kind of have it or you don't. You can work on it, but you might seem fake. So in my team, they, they're all very warm people. Competence is something that could be taught. You can be taught a hard skill. You can be taught to do a certain computer program, et cetera, et cetera, and given those hard skills. So I think that warmth is very, very important. I know Shane has in one of his, his slides from another presentation that we sometimes think of intelligence being correlated with how well you do in life, how well you do in your education and in your job. And really what we know is that you have to have a certain threshold of intelligence and then beyond that, it's all those soft skills, it's the warmth that gets you where you need to go. And it's interesting that people, you know, some of the t tweets are coming in saying, you know, can I make myself appear to have more warmth. Jennifer Lawrence, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with the letter that she wrote this week, she basically explained how she felt that she was to blame for not getting paid as her, uh, the same as her male colleagues mm. in, for a film. But she is saying that now she doesn't want to be likable anymore. You, you kind of, for some, particularly young women, I would think, you know, when it comes to the issue of money, you don't want to come across as kind of ruthless. But she in her letter is saying now is the time to become sort of more hardcore, I suppose. Can you make yourself appear colder? Like, is, does that have to, you have to create a new personality for yourself, or you know, what way does that work? I think it would be Get a, a better lot. Agent. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be a lot easier for someone who is naturally warm to turn on the cold and be angry or be not as warm as they would. Okay. Very hard to go the other way, don't you think, Shane? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I would think in her case, just get a better agent. Yeah. Seriously. Sure, so uh, we can tweet her that yeah, now, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm sure she'll be very impressed by that suggestion. <laughs> yeah, she will. Will you do it for her? Well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Excellent. <laughs> I want all about the money. Um, there's a, another question I wanted to ask. I, I don't know if I mentioned it already, but you know about product placement. There's been a lot of this mm -hmm. now. Like, I know Big Story, but Fair City now have product placement on, on their show. Um, there's a spa there. Is that to kind of humanize the brands a bit more? Or have we seen any impact on the, the I suppose, the, the, I suppose the impact that product placement does have, because it must work, because you know teams like X Factor and American Idol, American Idol always have the Coke glasses. Um, what way does that manipulate the viewers, I suppose, from product placement point of view? Well, I really wouldn't know, to be honest, um, about, about that, about that literature, yeah. but it does make sense if you like the show or you like the character and the character is drinking the Coke, you're going to do it You too. have an association, but I don't know anything about you know, studies that it have is interesting. It's something I suppose that is developing the whole way. Um, you can keep your questions coming in. We have hashtag Brain for Business going on Twitter. Um, I'm just trying to see here now. There's a lot of people who are asking about the Volkswagen thing. They're like just so intrigued by it. The, the scientist uh, who discovered the 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 flaw or whatever you, way you want to say it with the Volkswagen cars. Uh, he was talking to BBC the other day, and he was kind of saying that. That initially they wanted, to, because the, the emissions were supposed to be less in the US than they were in Europe. So he basically was doing this study to show off how good the US was and then found that they're actually worse than, or as bad as Europe. Is there a conflict in, you know, whistleblowers, like in damaging a brand? Is, is there a chance that the person who exposes this will then be vilified and the brand will still come out stronger? You know, that, that kind of thing I wonder about. Is he the villain in all this and people will still buy Volkswagen cars? Will that impact the no, brand I, long term? I think, well, I think the, the sales forecasts for Volkswagen are disastrous. Um, I think that there's a cultural issue. You have very strong whistleblower protection laws in the US and mm. you don't hear um, so the, there, there have been some amazing stories of whistleblowers in the pharmaceutical industry in the US, and they've been given awards of 70, 80 million dollars. Uh, so irrespective of what the, the pharma company does, they're walking off into the sunset knowing that uh, their life, financial security is assured. But uh, you don't have such protections here, and maybe that's a cultural difference between the Europe and the US. Mm. It's interesting. Uh, Misha here on Twitter is asking, uh, do you think artificial intelligence will ever s simulate warmth? I think that they're they're trying to get there, you yeah. know. And so, if you're saying the things like you know the smiling and the, the, the lines around the eyes, like, 
Well, people like avatars, you know, and yeah. you know, the, 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 there are these kind of interfaces that you can build uh, in VR and other things that people feel personally very attached to, mm. and people don't like electric shocking them, for example, and you know. <laughs> okay. Even when you think about Facebook and how you now have the choices, you don't just have to like, you can put smiley face or you can put wow or whatever it might be, I'm trying to add the human element into it to increase the feeling of warmth. Uh, Ty gets back again. He says, "Are there companies, uh, are there company case studies who took this research and implemented specific processes to go from lie to ho uh, low to high in both?" I think all the, the research that I've looked at has looked at existing companies and, and how they've operated and how they're seen in that matrix of, of warmth and competence. But I, I don't know of any studies that have shown, okay, this company is trying to move from this quadrant to this other quadrant and they've tried to use X, Y, or Z methods. Mm -hmm. uh, Linda is asking, where do su successful brands that um, children use fall on the matrix? What's the most impor important factor for success? Ooh, good question. Uh, I know uh, Fisk has done some studies on this in, in kids, and kids responded much the same way for the brands that they like uh, to, to the way that, we, that adults will respond to brands that, uh, that adults will like. But I don't know of anybody that's done any uh, imaging in kids. But I, I think kids uh, often enter into imaginary worlds, so I, I would actually think that they might attribute greater agency to brands uh, than we might. Mm. It might be a, an effect that's greater in children than it is in adults. It is interesting because I, I just know from my younger cousins, for example, that if a toy has a little jingle that they can sing along to, they'll be singing that for hours and <laughs> hours, hours and, and hours. hours and hours. <laughs> so I suppose you know, marketing and advertising really does work, so I think they kind of do get drawn to particular brands, but that's no scientific research, that's just my cousins. Um, <laughs> Another question here from Anonymous. Uh, are people from different, uh, from different countries, or sorry, do people from different countries have different patterns in warmth, warmth and competence? Uh, I think that's a great question, and Shane and I have discussed that in the past. And there are certain groups who are seen as being very warm. Um, just to make general characterizations, um, Latin American people are often perceived as very warm. They're warm in their body language, they're warm in their smiles. Um, other groups are seen as not being warm. Um, the Germans are not seen as being as warm. Now, those matrix that we were showing earlier with the people's faces and then with the brands, they've also done that for countries and, and cultures. And you know where the Irish land? High in warmth and high in confidence. <laughs> <laughs> We'll take that. I'm, I'm sure we could do the same for this country. Like, where do Kerry people lie? <laughs> I'm not from Kerry. Uh, don't uh, start this. Don't. Or, or people from Louth. Or, or Longford. Kevin, we'll move on. Um, we could start um, a riot in here. Uh, Ems asks here, uh, do men and women perceive warmth and competence the same? Well, I think this comes back to we all have our own personal view of what is considered warm and what is considered competent. You know, when I showed you guys those, those faces and then when we showed you the, the brands, the majority of you guys were agreeing, but there were some people who, who weren't quite agreeing. So I think it would be, in my mind, it would be more of an individual difference rather than men see things this way or women see things this way. What, yeah, I, I think the, the data show very much that as well. Um, uh, you know, you, you can think of individuals that both males and females would both universally see as being warm and competent and, or that elicit this kind of uh, incompetent uh, and cold thing. Okay, and uh, another question that has just uh, come in here now. Um, Carl says, uh, I suppose it's more of a statement as well, uh, can a true leader be viewed as warm and competent whilst having to make hard decisions? I don't believe so. Like, is there, is there a brand or is there an example of someone who kind of ticks every box, I suppose? Because we did have people when you were doing the game that people viewed as, like Marge Simpson, for example, as warm and competent. Mm -hmm. can, can, like, do you believe that, that you could be a powerful, competent, warm. Yeah, I, I, I'm guessing there? during the Second World War, Winston Churchill would have been seen in the UK as being a very powerful and, because of his oratorical qualities, a very warm individual who had to make terrible decisions under terrible stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is definitely, definitely possible. And I think that people who are both warm and competent as leaders, perhaps the people who uh, are working with them are very loyal to them because of that warmth. So they're leading their people out of the people's respect for them as opposed to you know, an iron fist. Um, another question here from Anonymous again. Uh, when thinking of psychopaths, for example, Ted Bundy, is it due to their irregular personality slash brain function that allowed him to fake his warmth? 
<laughs> yeah, but not having been personally acquainted with uh, Ted Bundy, I have no idea. Uh, I, I don't know much about well, him, to be honest. You, you know, when we, when we think about um, sociopaths, what we do know is that they can have a lot of charm, and they can have a lot of charisma, and they can manipulate. And there was um, an article that came out about two years ago in Scientific America, and it was talking about how the qualities of psychopaths in terms of the quick decision making and perhaps um, maybe seeming empathic but not really being empathic and being warm and charismatic, all of these sorts of things, they then could tie those same characteristics to people who are business leaders. And it was, it, I'll find the article for you, it's actually really, it was really, really interesting. We Did you had, see that? Yeah, I saw, there was one on the BBC today, and I work in News Talk, and I literally looked around my office, and it's the John Ronson thing again of the psychopath test. And the top jobs in which psychopaths kind of tend to go are CEOs, so I looked up the front of my office, journalists, I looked around my office, <laughs> people who work in TV, I laughed at like three or four people in the office. It's kind of, there is a particular type of person that, I suppose it's kind of scary. Well, you know, um, as part of my Especially job, you're me working in that office. <laughs> as part of my job, um, I'm always looking at people's soft skills when we're hiring into Alltech. And as I always say, when I'm, I'm reading through these psychometric assessments, etc., we all have certain personality characteristics, and they can be used for good or for evil. It's kind of what you do with what you've got. So you might be, you might have a certain personality, you might have a certain warmth to you, but you then are the agent. You can decide how that is going to be used. Talking of dealing with what you got, uh, Lisa asks here again, uh, are shorter people perceived as warmer? I have no idea. <laughs> I think, it, you know, because as a short person, and I have been a short person my entire life, believe it or not, people want to pick you up when you're small, and they just think oh. that's okay, and they want to kind of <laughs> hug you or like feel sorry for you in some way. Or is that just me because I'm a bit of an You're very warm. So, so if, someone was, yeah. if someone was seeing you like they, they were pitying you, that they wanted to help you, that yeah. would lead us to believe that you were high in warmth and you were perceived as being low in competence because maybe you couldn't awesome. reach up to the top shelf. <laughs> <laughs> that actually did happen to me. In our kitchen, we have like really high shelves and I had to get a tall person to, so I probably, that makes sense. <laughs> he solved this one for me. Um, Ty asks, what has been the best business or personal development books you have read or what business news sources would you recommend? Well, Shane and I based a lot of our talk today on Susan Fisk's book, um, which is called The Human Brand, and it's a really excellent book. I've had everyone in my team read it, um, and I think that it's, it's a great business book. I haven't read a lot of business books, but I think this is a great a business book because it's backed up by the neuroscience. So it's not just someone who thinks, well, this has worked for me, this hasn't worked for me, and here are my top 10 my top 10 list of things you need to do in marketing, or top 10 things in research, or whatever it might be. I really like the way this book backs up everything that she asserts with the neuroscience behind it. And her background book to that, uh, Envy Up, Scorn Down, is, is absolutely excellent. amazing book. It, it really is a wonderful book. I'd uh, say The Human Brand, if you want a quick, fun read over maybe a vacation or something like that. Um, the other book that Shane's referring to is, yeah, it's is a, a really deep read. It's a very yeah. deep, deep book, but very good. Okay, so you've got qu uh, time for, to get your questions in. We just have a few more minutes left, so hashtag brain for business or on the Slido thing, details are up above our heads. Um, so a question here that's quite interesting is, if you're going in for a job interview, how do you best uh, sort of show off your warmth and competence? Like, what can a person do? How can somebody carry themselves to show that they are warm and competent in, in the instance of a job interview? Well, I think being prepared for the job interview before you get there, having done all of your background research, knowing who you're going to meet, making sure that there are going to be no surprises. Google who you're going to be interviewing with. Um, make sure that you feel comfortable in what you're wearing. Make sure that you give a nice solid handshake with good eye contact. Deep breathing if you need to before to calm yourself down. All those things that make a really good first impression. Um, you know, if someone gives you sort of the wet fish, Handshake, it's done. You're not getting the job. <laughs> no, I'm um, not quite and, that And harsh, these are easy behaviors to engage in. Yes, these, and, and once you start in that engagement by having that good first impression, the person will. I mean, we go into situations, if it's a neutral person, I don't think we're, we're looking to, to pick holes in them. So if you can have a nice first impression and start to engage with the person over small talk or whatever it might be, you're off to the right start. There's a great story in the Financial Times just a little while ago. They uh, have a graduate recruitment program. They take on 12 new graduates every year. They get about 1,200 applicants. 
They reduced that down to 24 people somehow, and they always asked the question, which article did you like in our newspaper today? And invariably, a third of the people who go into interview say, sorry, I didn't read the paper, I was too busy uh, preparing. But you're going for a job in a newspaper. You know, think about the irony of that for a moment. Uh, how many of those people get the job? None. They, the instantaneous reaction is, if you can't be bothered to read our product and you want to work for us, we don't want you. Uh, so you, so do your uh, you're quietly shown the door. Interesting. Um, another question from Ems here. Uh, what brands are hitting the mark, what Irish brands, sorry, are hitting the mark for high warmth and competence in your opinion? Hmm. I'll leave that to you, Shane. Ryanair would have been, you know, people would say, rightly or wrongly, that they, I think they are competent because they, they do deliver you on time. They deliver you as a piece of pressed cheese in a packet. <laughs> but uh, I, they are trying to make that shift. <laughs> so maybe, uh, you know, they are an example. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's yeah. an interesting question. It's what we, we should put this to the audience, actually. It would be yeah, a, a much better way of... What, what do you think? Is there any brand, Irish brand, that's hitting the mark from both warmth and competence? Anyone? Uh, Ryanair, how many think they're warm and competent? I think they're doing a really good job. Yeah. Aer Lingus, warm and competent? No. Guinness. Guinness, Guinness. Guinness, Guinness is, is good terrible. <laughs> <laughs> they do have a nice warm Im image, though, and a consistent yeah. product. So. Jacob's Biscuits. Oh. What, what did you say out there? Barry's Tea. Barry's Tea. Kerry Gold, yeah. yeah. Tato. <laughs> well. Interesting. Okay, well, look, I think that's all we have time for, uh, unfortunately. If you want to continue the conversation, uh, you can use hashtag Brain for Business on Twitter, and we will uh, interact, and the guys might answer some questions afterwards. But thank you very, very much for coming along, and thank you to Shane and Aoife, and uh, we'll hopefully see you all again very soon. Thanks a million.